So we're going to turn to Britain now and go to more cursing in Britain. Not from the Israel Green Canal, though. Uh, from the Bards of Bob. Uh, and um, we're delighted to have Mr. Stephen <coughs> Clues, who is the um, manager of the uh, Roman Bards and the Pump Room at Bards. Um, it's been, uh, and, and has been for some time, it's been a very good year from down in Bath. Um, uh, there was uh, a few years ago, there was the extraordinary find of the so called Bow Street Hoard of almost 18,000 <coughs> Roman coins. And uh, with a grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund, they were able to purchase those. And they went on display yesterday. Did you say yesterday is the start of the display? Uh, and then also, uh, the other thing that happened last year was that um, the Bath, um, first tablets of Bath, of which there are some 130, um, uh, it was petitioned and they were inscribed on the UNESCO UK Memory of the World Register of Outstanding Documentary Heritage, uh, and are the first documents from Great Britain to be so inscribed, along with other things like the Doomsday Book and the Shakespeare Papers and so on. So anyway, it's our um, pleasure to, um, this evening to have um, Stephen talking to us about the cursed tablets from Bath, messages to the goddess revealed, private thoughts of ordinary people, Hear all about it. We're uh, well, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dominic, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, the cursed tablets uh, from Bath, uh, number one hundred and thirty, um, the uh, which uh, uh, makes them the largest single, certainly fully published group uh, from Britain. Um, the uh, uh, many of you will uh, know of the Yuli tablets uh, from the temple in Gloucestershire. Um, the uh, the Yuli tablets are, have been partially published. Um, the uh, there are 87 that have writing on, uh, but altogether there are 140 that uh, could ma match the description of a cursed tablet. It's it's just that um, uh, 53 of them are blank. Um, and uh, the, uh, there are some of the tablets from Bath that uh, have uh, nothing written on them. Um, but um, the, what I'm going to be talking about is something that you'll see as I go through it is quite different in character to what Esther has uh, been talking about. And uh, uh, we've, we're moving on quite a long way in time here. Um, the, uh, in terms of date, we're probably looking at roughly the 2nd to the 4th uh, century AD. And um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the focus of these tablets is, is rather different. Um, the, uh, they, they do wish terrible things on other people. But the, uh, the motivation for wishing terrible things on other people is rather different to what Esther has described. Um, the, uh, um, in fact, people only really wish terrible things on other people, it seems, on these tablets, if they themselves have suffered some sort of misfortune. And actually what they're seeking is uh, the writing of some wrong that has befallen them. And uh, uh, they would like the miscreant to be, public, to be punished, and the, uh, as is it's usually the wrong that's befallen them is one of theft, and uh, uh, they want to see the property recovered. Um, but uh, they don't always actually want it for themselves. They're quite content, or they appear to be content from what they say, um, uh, for the benefit of the recovery to go not to them but to the goddess. So uh, it's really justice that they're after here. You know, something's gone wrong, uh, they don't like it, and uh, uh, they want the goddess to sort it out and to uh, punish the, uh, the miscreant. So uh, just to look at uh, where we are, um, this is uh, a reconstruction drawing of Raymond Bath and uh, uh, the, uh, the spring lies at the very heart of this complex just here and the, uh, it is set there as you can see in that reconstruction drawing uh, in the corner 
of the precinct of the temple. And then ranging to the south is the bathhouse adjacent to it. So uh, a very close relationship between the two. That same hot water that is rising from the spring is going on to feed the bathhouse. Um, so by implication, if you're uh, bathing uh, within the baths, you're benefiting from water that in a sense is holy. Um, and, uh, but uh, when the uh, site was first developed, it wasn't on quite such a grand scale as this. And uh, indeed the spring was originally an open uh, pool within the corner of the temple precinct. And uh, the bathhouse wasn't so big. Uh, it was all on a, a, a more on a humbler scale, but um, the uh, uh, to look at the spring today, um, it looks like this, um, or certainly this evening. Um, it's in closely encroached upon by later buildings. But uh, going back to what the interior of that uh, Roman building may possibly have looked like, we're probably looking at something like this. Um, the, uh, once the enclosure building was put over it, access to that spring was restricted. And uh, uh, there were places uh, where uh, you could look through from the baths on this side over here, through some windows. And there was also a door on the other side, um, coming directly in from the temple precinct. And when access to a space is restricted, um, one of the effects of that is to give it a special status of some kind. And uh, that's probably what's going on here. By enclosing the space, they would uh, uh, have uh, uh, probably restricted access perhaps to certain functionaries uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, created a different feel, a different look and feel to to that space, may probably made it an altogether darker, more mysterious uh, kind of setting. And uh, uh, so this is the space into which the 130 cursed tablets were thrown. Now, the first of those was found in excavations uh, in 1878-1879. And uh, these were undertaken by Major Charles Davis who was the city architect and engineer. And uh, uh, one of his uh, routine tasks, uh, well, I say routine tasks, uh, a task that occupied him for many years, uh, was maintaining and developing the spa facilities in the city. And uh, at that time, the spring had been uh, turned into a bath uh, directly uh, over the... Um, uh, the Roman spring. So you have uh, the original Roman spring chamber with a medieval bath built directly on top uh, with the water coming up uh, from underneath. And uh, this shows what happened when he removed the floor. The reason he removed the floor was that he was trying to respond to issues um, that he believed were due to water leaking from the reservoir, from the Roman reservoir. And uh, it was uh, during these investigations, in fact, that uh, he discovered the, uh, the Great Bath in Bath. Um, but uh, uh, <coughs> when doing this work to the spring, um, he also recovered some antiquities. Uh, I think to call it excavation is um, probably not, uh, it's using a word in a way we wouldn't understand it today. Um, uh, but he did do, he did recover some things from the deposits. And uh, perhaps almost like a sort of superficial trawl. And it did include two cursed tablets. Uh, this uh, this is, is Davis. I should say, by the way, that he did have uh, an interest in antiquities. Uh, he was uh, uh, the uh, local uh, branch secretary of the Society of Antiquaries. Um, but uh, uh, having discovered two curse tablets, um, uh, he uh, clearly regarded them as outside his competence to deal with. And a photograph was sent uh, to Professor Zangermeister, 
who was uh, a professor of philology in Heidelberg and uh, uh, probably <coughs> the leading person of the day or one of the leading people of the day who might be able to pass an opinion on these things. And uh, the, uh, he was sent images of one uh, of the two curses uh, which he translated and it's since become known as the Vilbia curse and uh, of all the Roman curse tablets from Bath is, is probably the most famous. Um, what it does, it, uh, um, it, uh, uh, it's someone who is uh, seeking uh, uh, redress for the theft of Vilbiam uh, or Vilbia and uh, uh, we're not quite sure what Vilbia is he thought uh, it might be uh, something that would translate as uh, uh, a tablecloth or, or a napkin. Uh, others have said, well, it sounds like a female name. Um, the, uh, and, uh, uh, it's also been pointed out, well, perhaps it's just a misspelling um, of perhaps fibula like, uh, in some way. But um, uh, wh whatever Vilbia is, he asks that uh, the person who has stolen it should become as liquid as water and of course the curse itself has been thrown into water so there may be a sort of element of, of sympathetic magic there but uh, he actually lists 18 people who may have uh, been involved in the theft of Vilbia uh, they include both uh, males and females um, so if Vilbia is a woman and this is uh, someone who's uh, uh, heart has been stolen, uh, so to speak, then um, uh, it does sound a bit implausible. However, uh, of course, uh, in the ancient world, um, if it was a slave, then uh, a woman could indeed just be a piece of property, um, in which case that could actually be quite a good fit uh, for the way the curse works. Um, <clears throat> the after Davis's uh, investigations, the spring was next investigated again by Barry Cunliffe in 1979 and 1980, a hundred years later. And uh, the, uh, this was a much better conducted excavation and uh, the, many of the deposits were carefully sifted through um, to uh, recover finds uh, from the spring. But not everything was excavated and indeed as you can see in this image there is uh, quite a substantial bank of material here and to this day uh, that remains unexcavated so the 130 curses recovered from the spring are almost certainly not the full story there will be more down there um, <clears throat> The, uh, that excavation took place under uh, rather odd circumstances. People had to wear protective clothing because uh, of uh, a bug that was uh, present in the bath water. Um, and uh, in this image you can see uh, towards the top those dark marks are the oak piles that were driven into the mud to stabilise uh, the area of the spring before the reservoir wall was built. And uh, then you can see the sieving process taking place down below. A lot of things were found. Uh, Twelve and a half thousand coins is uh, the dominant thing. But uh, also um, pattery, uh, candlestick, uh, jug. Um, the mask is a tin mask. It actually comes from the drain just immediately outside uh, the uh, uh, outside the spring. But uh, also some other things, possibly an I uh, some ivory breasts, some um, and uh, fibula, uh, uh, sort of miniature uh, uh, bolt from uh, uh, catapult. Um, all sorts of strange things seems to have ended up in the spring. But uh, this drawing 
shows the extent uh, that has been excavated. And you can see this dotted line here, running along there. And it's the area to the south of that that's been excavated. So altogether, it's only just about, just over half uh, that has been explored. Today, those uh, uh, tablets are displayed in the museum. Here's one set, there's another set also. And uh, um, with uh, various elements of interpretation there. But uh, here are a few statistics about them. Uh, 130 altogether, a few unopened, um, some uninscribed, uh, the, uh, some have illiterate uh, markings, um, 29 are written in capital letters, 18 in New Roman cursive, which uh, kicks in about 275 AD, and uh, 64 in Old Roman cursive. Um, if you add up the total number of words on them, uh, you come to around 500, and there's 159 different names included on the curses. Very often, because they do include lists of names of people who are considered to be suspects in the crime, uh, as I mentioned with the Vilbia curse. The, uh, uh, some have nail holes, uh, they've been literally nailed. Um, the, uh, uh, this one has a nail hole, and it also just has one fragmentary piece of text, may their life be weakened. So whatever they've done, um, that's what uh, the, the person is seeking. Um, the, uh, some are folded here, these are some examples of folded ones. Um, this is the sort of implement that might be used. We don't actually have a, a stylus from the spring, but this uh, example is from uh, Vindolanda. Uh, the script itself, uh, in uh, Roger Tomlin's study, uh, he uh, produced these analytical tables uh, showing uh, all the letters as uh, uh, they're found in the curses. Um, the capitals, the Old Roman Cursive and the New Roman Cursive. In fact, there is another page of Old Roman Cursive letters. Um, but uh, once you start to break it down like that, it just become easier to try and read and analyse them. Um, when we look at the kind of things that they're talking about, uh, this one refers uh, uh, to the theft of a bathing tunic. Well, um, I mean, Romans didn't really wear bathing costumes, as we think of, but they did have a kind of tunic that they probably put under their, they would wear under their cloak to go to and from the bathhouse, and uh, that's probably what this uh, bathing tunic means here. Um, the, uh, this is uh, something slightly different. It's a, a sanction against perjury. And uh, it's the only curse that uh, deals with perjury. Um, but uh, they are known from other parts of uh, the empire. Um, <clears throat> in this case, we're told uh, that uh, an oath is taken at the spring on the 12th of April. But we don't know which year, uh, because it would have been obvious to everyone concerned which year it was, I suppose. They would have known. Um, so why put it? Um, the, uh, <clears throat> but... Uh, uh, a sanction against perjury is an interesting thing to see, just because it's anomalous, really. It is the, uh, the only one from Britain. Um, the, some pools um, uh, are sometimes described as perhaps seething pools. They're places where um, if something, uh, uh, a test uh, can be carried out to test whether someone has perjured or not. Uh, so Salinas tells us that in uh, uh, Sardinia there was a place where uh, people could bathe their eyes in uh, the hot waters of a spring and uh, if uh, uh, they had committed perjury they would go blind but if they had not then they would be fine um, at uh, another uh, site in uh, uh, Sicily, 
uh, something was, uh, an oath was inscribed and thrown into the water. If it floated, the, uh, the, uh, the, the person uh, had uh, committed perjury. If it sank, uh, no, sorry, if it, if it floated, they had not committed perjury. If it sank, they had. That could be a bit hazardous with a lead uh, curse, of course. Um, the <clears throat> uh, this is what the new Roman curse it looks like. I'm not going to attempt to um, lead you through it. Uh, the letter forms do take a lot of looking at to uh, uh, to appreciate and to uh, understand. This um, is an unusual item. It's uh, a small pewter plate. Um, it's got a list of names on it, nothing more, and it was folded and uh, thrown into the spring. The, uh, the great majority of the tablets have been folded in some way, so there's an element of secrecy about what's going on. Um, these aren't for public display, these documents, it seems. Um, there's no real evidence for anything well, there's possibly one where there uh, are a couple of nail holes that could have been to post it up somewhere. But for the greater part, that doesn't seem to be the intention. Um, these are the private thoughts of individuals, the private wishes of people that are being sent into the spring for the attention of the goddess only. This one um, refers to the theft of a silver ring. The, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we see here that uh, the lady who's had it stolen um, the, uh, gives it to the Temple of Mars. Interesting that it's Mars and not the resident deity, Sulith uh, Minerva. But um, uh, she's happily giving this to the temple. Um, the, uh, but uh, asks that uh, whoever has uh, stolen it um, should be accursed in his blood and eyes and every limb, or even have all of his intestines quite eaten away. Um, the, if he'd either stolen it or just been involved with the process in some way. And uh, this is uh, something different again. This has um, uh, become known as the Celtic curse. Um, uh, we don't know what it says. Um, because... Uh, there are very few uh, words uh, that survive from Britain in the Celtic language, and most of them are on this tablet. Um, the, uh, there is uh, another tablet from the Baths that uh, possibly has some Celtic names on it. But uh, at present, there isn't a sufficient corpus of uh, words that may be Celtic to uh, allow us to uh, begin to understand what the, the content of this might be. One or two of the words may be names, but uh, we don't know. And, uh, but uh, if we go abroad, if we go to Gaul, we, uh, uh, we can find that uh, there the local language is being written down on cursed tablets. Here's the uh, tablet uh, from Shamalia. And uh, uh, the um, <coughs> Uh, sufficient text is surviving there and with sufficient familiarity uh, to be able to start to suggest an interpretation for it. And uh, uh, the Larzac tablet uh, found in the 1980s has 160 words on it. So you're starting to build up here quite a big corpus of words um, that uh, uh, once you get a bigger corpus then you've got a better chance of being able to tackle interpretation and uh, particularly where documents may be written in more than one language. The, uh, <coughs> this is uh, believed to uh, refer to uh, uh, a curse against uh, a group of women, possibly sorceresses. Uh, more recently, um, just uh, two or three years ago from Le the site of Le Jacobin at Le Mans, um, the, uh, some more curses have come to light, again, appear quite possibly written in Gaulish. So, on, certainly on the, content, on the continent, the practice of writing um, in the local language using Latin characters uh, seems to have been taken, taking place. And so, it makes one think that perhaps it may just be 
the chance of survival that we actually only have one and terribly fragmentary at that uh, using uh, um, the local language here uh, in, uh, in a curse. Indeed, it may be that that is not British. It may be that it is Celtic from a different part of the Celtic world. Um, moving on, um, uh, Esther mentioned where curses are found, watery places. It is certainly true of this one um, from Hamblay on the uh, on the Solent, uh, on the estuary there near the Solent, uh, dedicated to Neptune, discovered on the beach. Um, where better to throw a curse uh, intended for the intention of Lord Neptune? Um, but uh, there are two other curses from Britain dedicated to Neptune, and they're also from watery places. Um, but uh, the, uh, not just watery places, but also temple sites is, is where they're found. The ones from Le Mans when they're um, uh, a temple site. The, this uh, from Bath, a different tack again, is uh, one that's also uh, uh, attracted a lot of attention. Um, it does look a bit like a moonscape here because of the corrosion effect on the curse. And uh, they're not all in brilliant condition. Uh, but this is the one that uh, acquired the uh, subtitle of the Christian curse. Um, essentially a curse about someone who's had six silver coins stolen. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, in it, they... Uh, um, oh yes, you can see a close-up of the lettering here, even closer there. Um, but this is what it says. Um, whether pagan or Christian, whosoever, whether man or woman, whether boy or girl, slave or free, has stolen from me, Amiena, son of Matutina, six silver coins from my purse. You, lady goddess, are to exact them from him. Um, and... Uh, uh, then the punishment sought is to reckon as the blood of him who has invoked this upon me. So they're after blood. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the point about whether pagan or Christian is that um, the word for pagan there is gentilis, which uh, uh, is uh, not how um, a pagan would describe themselves. Uh, it's a Christian way of describing a pagan. Um, and uh, the, uh, but at the same time, it's it's being offered as a as a contrast to Christian. So, um, so the thought is that is this therefore written by a Christian, um, because uh, it has that perspective. Um, the uh, uh, that's, that's certainly possible, but uh, it's also possible that it's just people who it's just someone who likes the. Um, uh, this kind of oratorical device of using opposites. Um, so whether man or woman, boy or girl, slave or free, um, is uh, using that style. But if we go back to where that style comes from, um, the, uh, you can um, pick up your Bible and uh, go to Galatians chapter 3 and see the words of St Paul. Um, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. Uh, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. So is the person who wrote this curse someone who was uh, familiar with this text? Uh, possibly so. The <clears throat> um, understanding uh, what uh, uh, these uh, uh, prayers are like and the, um, the nature of uh, pagan prayer um, can be a bit difficult because there aren't many prayers as such that uh, survive. But uh, elsewhere in the Bible, we see in Matthew um, uh, a, a view here of what a pagan prayer was about. Um, and uh, this message to Christians here is saying, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. So, okay, heathens use vain repetitions. Uh, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Um, so don't be like them, uh, for your father knoweth things uh, uh, ye have need of before ye ask him. So there is implying here that the Christian God actually knows what you're going to ask for anyway. 
so you don't need to keep um, doing repetition in this way. And then he goes on to give his example and he gives the Lord's, and at which point we get the Lord's Prayer. Um, but uh, I suppose if you really want to understand pagan prayer, going to the Christian Bible probably isn't the best place to find out about it. <laughs> uh, it's not really going to get a, a sympathetic hearing there. Um, so what you can do is go to one. Um, and uh, this is uh, Marcus Cato's prayer um, from uh, uh, the uh, 234 to 149 BC there. And if you read that, um, actually there isn't a lot of repetition in this. Uh, this is just a conventional prayer um, uh, to, uh, uh, to Mars, um, uh, the uh, uh, seeking uh, protection really of... Uh, uh, his uh, farm and his uh, estate and asking that uh, things be looked after and cared for and yes he does do sacrifice at the end but uh, apart from that you could sort of sort of top and tail this and you'd be left with something that would probably be quite acceptable in the Church of England today um, in terms of content um, the <coughs> one um, uh, curse that uh, is uh, particularly interesting, really for sort of historical reasons, is this one, number 100. Uh, the fact that it is number 100 is significant. It's actually one of the original two curses. Um, but uh, uh, when uh, Roger Tomlin was uh, uh, producing the uh, publication of the Bath Curses, uh, he gave this one the status of number 100. Um, it's, uh, it's curious, um, partly because it's lost, but, uh, uh, and uh, when one curse was sent to Zangermeister, this is the one that didn't go, uh, but uh, um, Edward Nicholson, who was uh, Bodley's librarian, uh, did have a go at translating it. And uh, uh, the, uh, this is uh, Roger Tomlin's drawing of the, uh, uh, from a photograph that survives in the Bodleian, even though the curse is now lost. Now, when, um, uh, <clears throat> when uh, he attempted to translate it, uh, he published it um, as uh, a letter uh, from, uh, in, from southern England um, from Vinicius to Nigra, it was called. And this is his translation of it. And uh, as you can see, it, uh, uh, it, uh, it's assuming here that uh, there's a Christian reference. Uh, they even get a reference to the dog of Arias, you know, it's the Orion heresy appearing in here. Um, this was an amazing uh, thing to produce. Um, but um, by 1906, when the Victoria history of the county of Somerset was produced by uh, the, the section, relevant section on Rome and Britain, was written by Francis Haverfield, he wrote this I have carefully examined the tablet with this paper in my hand, meaning Venetius to Negro and I regret to be altogether unable to accept the interpretation given in it. Whether the scratches on the tablet represent letters at all may be doubted, but so far as I can read them into letters, they do not correspond with Mr. Nicholson's decipherment. So, um, you know, quite a firm shooting down here of Bodley's librarian. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, and... Uh, Haverfield felt that it was um, basically an illegible or illiterate inscription. Um, the, <clears throat> um, when Roger Tomlin came to look at this, because Haverfield's opinion was accepted and just sort of copied on, um, uh, when Roger Tomlin came to look at it, the curse was lost, but he did have the surviving photograph to go on. And uh, uh, what you may not have noticed is that between when I first showed the first image and this, uh, it is now reversed because Roger Tomlin concluded that uh, uh, Mr. Nicholson was actually trying to read it upside down. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, which uh, could explain the difficulty. 
Um, and uh, having turned it this way around, um, he then produced uh, a translation that uh, was uh, altogether uh, more conventional. Um, and uh, so this is uh, Roger Tomlin's interpretation. And uh, he concluded that uh, probably Nicholson you know, hadn't got much familiarity with New Roman Cursive and uh, um, probably Professor Hatfield hadn't encountered it much either. Um, the, uh, but uh, this is um, how he translated it. And it's got this rather, rather intriguing reference at the end to a bushel of cloud or a, a bushel of smoke. You know, what on earth is that all about? Um, well, he, he does refer, um, uh, he'd obviously remembered his Plautus because he remembered a line um, that he <coughs> drew attention to. It says that seven nights with her are not worth one twelfth of a <coughs> pint of cloud. <laughs> <laughs> which is the sort of thing one can imagine coming out of Plautus. Um, the, uh, but uh, I was quite intrigued by this when I was uh, putting this talk together the other night, so uh, I, I followed, followed that up and did a bit of maths on this and uh, came up with, well, a bushel of cloud, you know. How big is a bushel? Well, I found one, and um, I must confess I had forgotten how much the volume of a bushel is. Uh, but um, a twelfth of a pint uh, for seven nights uh, gives you that. So a pint is, uh, would therefore give you 80 ni 84 nights. Uh, so it's not worth 84 nights. Um, the, uh, uh, the gallon is uh, eight times a pint, so that would be 672 nights. So she's not worth it. Uh, 672 nights on Plautus's scale. Um, so a bushel, which is eight um, gallons, gives you that, which is about 15 years. Um, so there we are. <laughs> so um, it's sort of slightly pointless exercise, but quite amusing, I suppose. Um, but um, uh, as one does in the, uh, the late night when one goes into internet ramblings, um, the, uh, I pursued this a little further and uh, uh, came across this, which is bushel. And it's uh, another definition of bushel. It's the name of a company <coughs> that manages and protects your Apple devices anytime from anywhere. Uh, and it says, bushel is a cloud-based <laughs> mobile device, device management solution. <laughs> so uh, it's quite interesting how words change their meaning over time. And indeed, it may be that the cloud and smoke that is referred to in the curse uh, from Bath may not mean quite the same thing as the cloud and smoke that Plautus um, had in mind. Who knows? But uh, anyway, I thought that was quite amusing. Um, anyway, more seriously, going back to the curses, um, <clears throat> the, uh, they do focus on theft. Now, because all, many of the curses are fragmentary, you don't get full text, so the fact that there are 130 uh, doesn't mean that we've got a, hundred and th a list of 130 stolen things. Um, but uh, here you can see, I put them all together. Um, there's the case of Vilbia, I've already discussed, which is highlighted in red. On the right are a whole list of things. Uh, coins, blankets, bathing tunics, cloaks, jewellery, bracelets, silver, another ring, a pair of gloves. All things which Roger Tomlin pointed out could have been stolen from the baths next door. Um, and there are only just a few things that aren't. If we go to Yuli and the evidence from the curse is there, a very different profile of things that are being stolen. Um, pretty agricultural, really, um, which is what you might expect. Um, <clears throat> punishments. These are the sort of punishments that are wished upon people. Uh, to lose both mind and eyes, become as liquid as water, inflict death upon them, not allowed sleep or children, and so on, down that list. Um, the uh, blood is important as a punishment. And uh, the, uh, so here at Yuli, where <coughs> uh, the curses are being thrown here into the spring in this uh, reconstruction illustration, um, that's not actually their final resting place because they do seem to have been dispersed around the site by a later development. And uh, so from that building, 
uh, to the building behind it is actually where most of the curses have been found. And uh, here is one of them uh, from the Temple of Mercury. And the, um, this is very similar in character to the Bath ones. They're all pretty much the same. So the, the curses now have been registered um, with uh, UNESCO as uh, um, uh, with a, a special status through the Memory of the World project. They're the first documents from Roman Britain to have been given this special status. Um, the, uh, there is the potential for that to happen to other documents also in the future. Um, and uh, it would be good to see some more Roman material uh, from Britain getting up onto that register, I think, because it raises its profile. And uh, uh, certainly, uh, since this has happened, there's been far more interest in the curses from Bath as a result of the uh, extra publicity given to it by this uh, Memory of the World scheme. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, that splendid uh, explanation of the context and introduction to the content.